Uh, firstly, thank you very much uh, uh, to the Indira Gandhi Institute, to Trujan, and to the Vanderbilt Law School for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, and, uh, you know, finance is something that I normally run away from. Uh, never quite understand it, never have understood it, and uh, I don't think things are going to change as I get older. But, um, uh, but I thought I'd, I'd, I'd use the occasion to reflect uh, on something that uh, uh, financial experts uh, will have a better uh, understanding of, namely, again, I think something that, uh, uh, that Professor Fishman touched upon as well, uh, which is uh, the idea of risk uh, and the idea of uncertainty and how do we deal with that and how does the IP regime as we know it today, particularly patents, throw that up in, um, in, a, in a huge way um, and how is the system sort of responding to it. Um, so first I want to start with, uh, with highlighting what I see as the irony of IP. Uh, and the irony of IP is, is this, at least insofar as it applies to patents, uh, is that people would tell you that patents are about innovation and creativity, um, that you want to see more radical ideas, you want to see better ideas, you want to see more creative ideas, you want to see disruption. And yet the regimes that are meant to protect this creativity and this disruption and this innovation have remained largely status quoist and largely static. And that to me is uh, in one way a paradox, in another way a classic irony. Uh, that uh, our patent regimes and the model behind appropriating the value of invention through an IP regime, has, uh, the model has remained largely the same for several centuries with some tweaks and twists here and there. Um, and of course now there's a lot of pushback uh, given the issues that crop up with access to medicines and, and a lot of things and people are looking at alternative in, uh, innovation models. Uh, but within the traditional segment, I think IP, patents, copyright, etc., the model has remained largely the same. Um, now, that would have been okay if uh, most of us acknowledged that all is well with the world of patents, uh, but unfortunately that's not so. In fact, I think uh, if you take a head count, and I'm wondering who might do that at some stage, a nice empirical study of the number of people that teach intellectual property, and I find it very odd that it's one of the few subjects that, uh, which has maybe about 70 to 80 percent of people teaching it that don't intrinsically believe in it. Um, so, you know, the people teaching environmental law will will believe somewhere that regulations do help protect the environment. Uh, people teaching labor law will believe to some extent that there's some amount of regulations will help the labor market. Uh, but I think a vast majority of people that teach IP actually don't think that intellectual property contributes to innovation or creativity in significant ways. And I talk about a majority. I mean, of course, uh, you've got a, a fairly diverse set of people doing IP as well. Um, so what is wrong with the world of patents? Uh, and I'm not going to speak the language uh, of uh, activism and, you know, bring in Marxism and, and socialism and all those things. I'll just flip it on its economic head itself and say that uh, just from a purely economic lens, uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, people have raised questions, serious questions, about its efficiency. And efficiency at the very simplistic model of just cost benefit. You know, what does it cost, the patent system, and how much are people benefiting out of it? And there have been several studies. Uh, and I think uh, there have been uh, economists who have come down on the side saying it's, it's way costlier uh, than the benefits uh, that it uh, actually throws up. And you can see that analysis sort of playing out in courts as well. And you have uh, Richard Posner, uh, who in a very striking judgment and you know, sort of father of law and economics, um, someone who views the entirety of IP through an economic lens, come up and say that, well, I'm not going to grant an injunction in this case as a judge, right? So I'm not going to grant a restraining order in this patent case because the cost of the injunction would far outweigh the benefits uh, that it actually, the cost of the injunction to society and to the defendant would far outweigh the cost, to the benefit that it might confer on the IP owner. Um, but I'm not going to go so much on the cost versus benefit analysis, but rather on a connected point, which is this system as I see it, and I find it very worrying that not many people are speaking about this, at least. Uh, from academia is that the system is inherently indeterminate. And that's okay. I mean, people will tell you that the, you know, certainty is uh, a, a very elusive goal to assume that things can be certain is to be foolish in one sense. So the law will work with uncertainty and most legal regimes tolerate some level of uncertainty. Uh, but I think with patents, and, and this is my intuitive feel, I've not empirically validated it or you know, formulated models with mathematicians to, to figure out if uh, it's disastrously indeterminate, but I, but, but I suspect that the patent regime's indeterminacy is not insignificant. It's, it's highly significant. Uh, it's highly substantial. 
Uh, and it may perhaps have reached a threshold beyond which you just say that, well, the system just doesn't work at all. You know, there must be a common, there must be a common baseline for how much of indeterminacy or how much of uncertainty that a legal system can tolerate. Uh, and I suspect that going forward, the patent system will get even more uncertain, even more indeterminate than it is today. So what contributes uh, to this uncertainty? Um, and uncertainty at several, several levels. Right? I mean, uncertainty at just the purely legal level when we look at patents and innovation, uh, which is the standard for protecting patents. Uh, uncertainty at the technological level, that you might have a patent, and that patent might protect what we typically call an invention. But to take that invention and convert it to an innovative product, or the translation from invention to innovation, that's again fairly uncertain. You never know when you can convert a good scientific thought or discovery uh, or a technical breakthrough into a nice innovative product uh, that will work. And two is even if you've got a nice innovative product, it's a classic innovation, it's, it's supposed to work, uh, the market may not buy it. Uh, you may be well ahead of your times, uh, so there's a commercial uncertainty as well. Uh, so I I'll focus mainly on the legal. So where does the legal uncertainty come from? And the legal uncertainty really is um, if you look at patentability criteria, uh, most regimes by and large, and this comes from uh, the basic baseline standard espoused by TRIPS as well, stipulate that you, you shall grant a patent when something is new, inventive, and useful. Novelty is by and large easy, relatively easy to determine. It just asks a simple question, are you new? Technically, are you new? Uh, you know, have you presented something that never existed before? But inventive step or non-obviousness is a highly, highly subjective standard. And it pretty much, you know, much like equity in the old days, it varies according to the judge's foot, the chancellor's foot. Uh, very subjective inquiry, which is, and it's a cognitive test, right? Are you cognitively superior to something that existed before? Did you make such a quantum cognitive leap uh, to take you out of the realm of just sheer obviousness? Would a person who normally works in your field have looked at this invention and said, yeah, but I could have done it. You know, it's obvious. And that test is easier. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's relatively very, very difficult to apply that in any sort of objective way. And courts that have done it in an objective way have, have come up with standards that many have found fault with, including the US courts, where the Supreme Court had to come back and say, well, there is something called common sense. So do not have a rigid formula saying that this is the only time that we'll find something to be inventive and something to be obvious. Uh, you, have to, you have to base it on common sense as well. Common sense might sometimes tell you that this is obvious. You don't need to go looking for very static formula boxes. A windsurfer international uh, is a classic case that brings out again, uh, you might think that you have a valid patent, uh, but it could be knocked down any day. Uh, so there's, there's a certain ephemerality to patents that, uh, you know, you've got it registered, you've gone through a very strict examination process at the patent office, and yet some years down the line you just find that uh, it's not valid anymore and pat because patents in many countries, including India and the United States, can be challenged anytime. So just because you've got a patent doesn't mean it stays with you, it can be challenged, and typically it is always challenged in an infringement action. So if you're a patentee and you file a suit for infringement against uh, uh, somebody who allegedly infringes your patent, the first line of defense that they will typically take is that the patent is not valid, that it should not have been granted in the first place. And most regimes do this also because they accept the fact that patent offices uh, are resource crunched and typically will not always make the right decision. So there's a high error rate at patent offices uh, and therefore it's necessary for courts uh, before whom infringement actions are bought, to relook at whether the patent was validly granted at all in the first place. And this windsurfer was a fantastic invention. Um, it combined the best of surfing and sailing. So somebody just came and said, you know, I like surfing and I like sailing. What if I put both together? So I can surf, but I can surf with the help of a sail, so I can direct myself as well. And the person, two, two of them who patented this, uh, made truckloads of money after they took out their patent, and it was the time uh, during which the windsurfing sport was also getting more popular. It's an Olympic sport as well now. And obviously, when you have a successful product like the windsurfer and you have a great market for it, there are going to be infringers. Somebody infringed. And as soon as they were sued, the first line of defense that they took was, well, this is not valid. 
And their lawyers went and searched high and low, and they actually found that a 12-year-old boy in a small island, in Hailing Island, about a decade ago, had drawn a sketch of something that looked vaguely similar to this. And that was enough to invalidate uh, this patent in the UK, saying that, well, it, it may be slightly new because it's slightly different from the sketch, but from that sketch, it's obvious that you could have got to the patent that was covered by the windsurfer, by, the, by this particular company. And uh, therefore, the patent got knocked down. No, no fault of the patentee. The patentee assumed that, you know, we've done all our searches. This is a new invention. But here comes a sketch from uh, a small boy. And kids typically, you know, the, the, given the creativity of kids, it's quite possible that they, they, they come up with fanciful creations and they sketch it out nicely. And fortunately for the defense attorneys, they, they happened to spot it, and it, it was used to invalidate the patent. Statistics and empirical studies that have been done worldwide uh, demonstrate that litigated patents, at least 50% uh, of them are invalidated across countries with variations here and there. So Germany is slightly on the higher side. Litigated patents, I think 70 to 75% are invalidated. Uh, India, I'm doing a study now, it's almost an 80% strike rate and higher. And if you take, and this is just invalidity before courts, if you take oppositions before patent offices where somebody files a patent application or somebody gets a patent but it can be opposed to the patent office itself, the strike rate is even higher. And why do I think that this will get even worse as we go forward is because if you look at the whole globalization dialogue and, and, and how it's panning out with intellectual property, countries are asserting their territorial right to evolve patent standards in a way that suit their national priorities more and more. They're finding that TRIPS is fairly flexible. The international instrument does not really constrict or limit you in very precise ways. It gives you fairly decent wiggle room, and uh, Daniel, uh, I think, will be more of an expert on that. And, 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 and uh, the investment case is a classic example of that, where uh, Canada really said, this is the way we're going to apply our law. We are going to insist on a slightly stricter threshold than what you might have been used to in the United States. India is doing the same. Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, all of them are picking up on the Indian standard for pharmaceutical inventions and pharmaceutical patents. And I think going forward, we may see that countries uh, are a little more rigorous about applying patentability criteria. Uh, and they're staffing their patent offices more and more with more resources. And going forward, um, we also have artificial intelligence. And you have uh, machines uh, that can create, can make inventions, can create. And, and the latest debate on the table is whether you can give them IP rights. If a machine comes and puts together two pieces of prior art, which is what combinational creativity is, which is what most inventions are. If you survey uh, a lot of patents, the majority of patents are, are somebody putting two pieces of prior art together, combining them in a unique way, what we call combinational creativity. And machines can do that far better because they can access more prior art than you and I can ever do with our limited brains. And if the machine is now to be the standard for creativity, because that's what patents are really about, it measures whether you're inventive depending on who you're person skilled in the art is, if machines are going to be the people skilled in the art, because they're the ones inventing tomorrow for the future, then almost nothing is going to be invented. And of course, the other thing is that do patents really, and, and this is a point that Daniel touched on, do patents really function as real property? And this is the other bit that we're getting more indeterminate, uh, indeterminacy within the patent regime because it's very difficult to read a patent claim and understand what it contains. Unlike real property where you can put a stake and say this is my property and you can show somebody that this is my property, patents are extremely difficult to read and define and confine. What's the bound of patent? And in many ways, uh, patents are, are paradoxically enough trade secrets as well because the crafty patent attorney will hide more than they reveal. And you found that in Canada in a particular case where a judge really admonishes, again Pfizer, uh, in it was the Viagra patent, a very famous patent, when they were invalidating, saying that, well, you've, you've, you know, you've, you've done a claim for 260 qu quintillion compounds in your claim one, and you've not told us exactly what the compound is that you're seeking protection for. So please don't play hide and seek. So patents here are performing largely a trade secrecy function. So where do we go from here? And I'll end with this. If patents are so uncertain and don't really perform a property-like function, and they don't give you uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of um, uh, protection that you need as an investment protection mechanism, 
then why don't we move more directly to an investment protection regime? At least in sectors like pharmaceuticals, where it's widely acknowledged that you need some sort of appropriation uh, mechanism if not people are not going to invest in R&D. But patents don't ask the question, how much have we invested? Patents ask the question, did you have a smart idea? And do you have a smart idea from a cognitive standpoint? The Viagra case is a, is a great example for demonstrating that cognitively, you may not have had a great idea because scientists had already written papers saying that you might want to look at this particular, these particular series of molecules uh, that have been used for blood pressure and heart ailments because they relax the blood vessels. It might potentially prove useful for male erectile dysfunction as well because the functionality is almost similar. Now somebody had to go take it, test it, try it, spend millions of dollars in clinical trials. Uh, so if you ask the cognitive question, was your drug a smart drug? Did it come out of a really creative cognitive thought? The answer is possibly no, so it fails on the patent test. But did you invest money and get a new drug that's valuable for society? You did. So why don't we just ask the direct question and say, let's protect the investment directly? Uh, and that, you know, when, when, when I raised this issue many years ago, uh, as part of my PhD thesis, I think my examiners uh, and a lot of other people, the, the, the apprehension that they had was that it's difficult to get costing for pharmaceuticals. Because in those days, it was difficult. It's, it's a classic trade secret again. But if you look at today what's going on and the high drug prices, even in, in a, a highly capitalist economy such as the United States, and you see Martin Shikeli there who generated a lot of controversy by jacking up the drug price quite arbitrarily from $13 to $750 after having bought out the drug. And he's a hedge fund guy. He's not even a pharmaceutical guy. Uh, and you have a lot of hedge fund people now coming into patents, and now people are beginning to understand that we need to go back, and legislators and lawmakers are now asking the serious question, how much does it cost to make a drug? So let's get that figure, and let's then find out how much do, you, do we think, at least with healthcare and, and, and public health, we might want to regulate it better, even in terms of pricing. So once you have people now consciously trying to regulate pricing within a sector that performs a very valuable uh, public health objective, uh, I think the task then to have an investment protection regime uh, becomes far easier. So with that, uh, let me end. Thank you very much.